we commit ourselves in thy, uh, thine own hands, make the best use of us that can be. Hold us fast to your best. Amen. March 36, when I was waiting in a car for friends in Lake Worth, Florida, to do some shopping, it was spoken out through me, I'm perfect everything, and I'm giving you perfect everything. So far as I know, that is the first time in, in uh, history that our glorified Lord uh, referred to himself as being perfect everything and as giving perfect everything. That precisely describes it. He's perfect God and perfect man, united as one. Perfect divinity and perfect humanity in an everlasting union. Perfect soul and perfect body. Perfect savior and perfect salvation. Perfect health and perfect healer. Uh, perfect life and perfect life giver. Uh, everything combined and brought to perfection and brought to perfection in perfect balance and, and in perfect fulfillment. He's the, he's the highest availability in the universe. He's the highest achievement in the universe. He's God in, in successful incarnation, uh, self-offering, resurrection, uh, and glorification uh, at the height of the universe. Hallelujah. God's everywhere, but he's in perfect achievement and perfect availability in Jesus Christ. Uh, the eternal Christ lights up every life coming into the world. But this eternal Christ, hallelujah, uh, has been brought forth in human form, in self-offering and triumph, hallelujah. And it's perfect everything now on the outside of us, knocking and longing to come on the inside of us. The eternal Christ is already within us, but the glorified Jesus is the great outsider, seeking to, to come within. So behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and sip with that one. And the highest thing we can do now is to receive this glorified one within. And if you're true to the eternal Christ who lights up your life, that light will lead you to Jesus. And that light will cause you to recognize that he's, uh, he's Lord and you want him to come within. And when you both want and invite him to come within, he comes within. Well, you raise the question, is he not already within? The eternal Christ is within. But Jesus, to most people, is yet the great outsider seeking to come within. In other words, the eternal Christ, who's universal, uh, the divine word by which everything is made that was made, the uh, creative and the sustaining principle of the universe, the light that lit up Buddha, the light that lit up Socrates, the light that lit up everyone. Hallelujah. In the fullness of time, uh, became man. And in his incarnation, he said, uh, God succeeded in breaking through on the human realm. Uh, Max Muller, in his book on psychological religion, developed there so, so splendidly. The whole effort has been for God to break through and get down on our level. And for man to break through and come up on the throne of God. That's precisely what's happened in Jesus. The divine broke through in him. Absolute love broke through him in a realm of hate. Absolute life was brought forth in him in a realm of so much death. Absolute health and healing came forth through, through him. Uh, perfect everything broke through from the heavenly world and came in the human realm. And he is perfectly aware that he could have ascended, but uh, saw that if he ascended, he'd be like a grain of wheat that had not been planted. But if he identified himself with us in our sensibleness, uh, to use time this phrase, if he plunged down into the deep, cold waters of death and came up triumphant, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. it made the connection between the heavenly world and our world. And after that, especially after he went into glory and received the promised gift of the Holy Spirit, then each one of us can be born 
in the realm of perfect everything. We become babies in a new order. And when you get the baby, all you've got to do is to grow the baby. And when the baby's grown up, he'll be like the one who begets him. And so you and I do not have to repeat the long process, whether you believe in reincarnation or not. If you do believe in it, you've been coming a long time and haven't gone very far yet. <laughs> and you'd have a long time to go before you ever arrived in the likeness of Jesus Christ. But after the perfect has been brought forth, if you're born of, uh, of the perfect, hallelujah, you're only, you've got your baby, and you've only got to grow your baby. And it's our high privilege now to be baby, hallelujah, when we get full grown, that'll be in the full likeness of Jesus Christ. Uh, you see that working everywhere. I don't know what the original horse was. Uh, it's said to be about the size of a dog. Well, you don't have to go back to him. You wouldn't find him if you went back. Hallelujah. And it didn't take you a long time by a process of breeding and exercise to bring forth a horse just up to the highest level that horses have come now. But if you get your coat from the highest achievement of horses, all you've got to do is to grow your coat. And your coat might be ahead of the horses. And so Jesus contemplated that those that believed in him well, by quick processes, through union with him his glory, might do not only the things he did, but might do greater things, because he goes to the Father. As I understand, this means that Jesus only had the advantage ground in the incarnation of infinite spirit. All the potentialities of God were bound up in him, but had not been brought to triumph. Now, all of those potentialities have been brought to triumph. And anyone in union with him now has a decided advantage over anyone in union with the infinite spirit on the plane of the incarnation. So when Jesus Christ went into the glory world with power to reproduce himself in us, it don't matter what happens to us on the outside, we can always be in heavenly places in him. We can be in heaven on the way to heaven. And if you go the other way, you'll be in hell on the way to hell. <laughs> and the heaven that he provides, you'll have to become heavenly in order to enter it. Hallelujah. Uh, the Son of quotes Jesus to having said to him that hell is the extreme mercy of God for the sinner. I once heard Camel Morgan say in a sermon on Our God is Consuming Fire, and there's no one more orthodox than Campbell. So you're on safe ground quoting him among the fundamentalists of the fundamentalists. He said it's most likely true that there's only one fire in the universe. And if you're in the condition of hell, it's going, going to be hell fire. But if you've been purified to the point of heaven, it'll be heavenly fire. Uh, as I remember, uh, Swedenborg says that, that there are three angels that meet every person on the other side. And if they're ready to go to the highest realm, quickly they'll be taking it. If they have this heavenly thing within them, and there's a certain amount of development that necessary, they're given the necessary training. Want to know of one man where he wanted to go, and said he wanted to go to heaven. He belonged to the nice folks, and heaven is the only place where nice folks go. Well, they said, you wouldn't like it. Well, he, he's going, he insisted he wouldn't go anywhere else. They let him try it. They got up there where everybody saw through it. He cried out and says, take me to the other place. <laughs> I'd rather be anywhere than here. Well, I see, when Jesus was here on earth, you didn't have to tell him anything. He knew the whole thing, didn't he? Well, now if you're in love with another man's wife, hallelujah. How, how embarrassed you'd be in heaven. <laughs> You'd rather be where they didn't know so much. So if you really want to go to heaven, you've reached the highest point of aspiration. And you're not far from being there. Hallelujah. Uh, the heavenly kingdom, uh, as revealed in Jesus Christ, and it revealed in the Bible, is the sinless kingdom, a diseaseless kingdom, and the deathless kingdom. The present order of things admits that sin, sickness, and death. And in the midst of man's disobedience, God's doing a wonderful job uh, with the material he's dealing with. 
I'm greatly pleased with God, so far as I understand it. <laughs> and I feel if I understood, uh, understood it, I'd approve of him totally. Uh, and so the present order is, it don't matter uh, how badly we are messed up, if we turn ourselves over to the great unmesser, he unmesses the, uh, the messer and makes an ass out of the mess. <laughs> it don't matter how much we've dissipated and gone from problem to problem until we become a problem. If we turn ourselves over to him, he turns our problems into testimony. In him, everything is opportunity. It don't matter what it is. He turns everything to good that's turned over to him. Life is not uh, simply full of a whole series of opportunities. Life is opportunity. And when you swing into him, he looks after your past as well as the present. If he didn't, we'd be in a fix. Uh, so his goal is to make us like himself. Everything that reproduces at all reproduces after its kind. But Jesus said even Satan could bring forth children in his own spirit. But Jesus Christ brings forth children in his own spirit, in his own nature, in his own potentiality, and does a better job in growing them up than any human parent has ever been able to do with human children. Where Jesus now is, is St. John caught the vision. There's nobody sick. There's nobody dying. There's nobody crying. There's nobody lacking. And St. John saw that heavenly order coming down towards the earth. And Jesus didn't pray to take us out of this evil world, but he prayed to keep us from the evil. And he prayed that this heavenly order may triumph in the human order. That's the whole movement of history. Hallelujah. Uh, to bring the highest down to the realm of the lowest. And that's precisely what the incarnation is. The most high getting in the realm of the most low. With power to lift the lowest up to the highest. His, his coming to us was very costly. It cost him everything. Our movement to him, we only give up the things that are good riddance and get everything. Uh, I asked for the truth about the cross when I was seeking for the Holy Spirit. Some brother said, advised me to first get orthodox, and the Lord might consider baptizing me. But he didn't think he'd just consider me, hallelujah, in my present state. <laughs> uh, I told him, well, hallelujah, that the promise of the Holy Spirit was not to the orthodox, neither to the orthodox, but to those who hunger and thirst and ask. But I did ask to know what the meaning of the cross was. And when the revelation commenced coming with so much new light about Jesus and the wonder of Jesus, thus an accumulated glory, hallelujah. And when the power of heaven came upon me and had me, and I think that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have many anointings of the Spirit, you can have many refillings. But at that point where it has every bit of you, hallelujah, spirit, mind, soul, body, tongue, and everything, when you're willing for him to take over, and he takes over, that's the baptism. You see, our Baptist brethren don't feel they baptize you unless they get all of you under. Don't want a thing left out. <laughs> well, the Lord, when he baptizes you, wants for the time being to seal you with himself. To brand you as belonging to him. Hallelujah. And show you uh, in an instant, so to speak, what your eternal place in the kingdom will be. I don't think I'm to lead, uh, lead, uh, lead the heavenly choir, but I'm to sing it, because when the Holy Spirit took possession of me, it's the most beautiful singing I've ever heard. Well, I don't do it in the natural. And so I just tear up. I, I'm not jealous of the good singers. I've heard the Lord sing better than I've heard anybody else. I, I may not can sing now, but I'm going to sing. And we're not uh, very much embarrassed about our present status, and we're sure of having a better one. If I didn't have a penny uh, today, I knew I'd be a millionaire 
tomorrow I'd be rich. If I had a million today and you, I wouldn't have a cent tomorrow, I'd be poor, even while I was rich. <laughs> and so when this heavenly world ascended and took possession of me, which is, I understand, the heavenly baptism, the Spirit was singing, Jesus, Jesus, how I love you, interposed his precious blood. Very orthodox. And then my body went through all of the processes of being put on the cross. But it was not a cross of agony, but a cross of flesh. Not a cross of death, but a cross of life. Not a cross of separation, but a cross of ineffable union. Not a cross of giving up the Holy Ghost to the Holy Breath, but a cross where I received the Holy Ghost to the Holy Breath. So he who knew no sin became sin in our behalf, that we may be the righteousness of God in him. He took upon himself our negative, that we may take his positive. He became what we were, that we may become what he is. His process of, of getting to us is costly in the extreme. Our process of our, our movement in going to him is glorious beyond thought. As I said, I never have had to give up anything that is worth keeping. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everything he wants you to give up is a good riddance. We do love you, Lord. Uh, uh, in him, uh, you, have, you have everything. You have perfect, he's your perfect guide and your perfect guidance, as we indicated before. Uh, you can't think of anything. He's, he's your perfect life and he's your, he's your perfect life giver. In him, you have abundant life. He's your perfect health and your perfect healer. He's your perfect baptizer. You can't think of anything, but that he is the attained perfect, and he's giving, he's giving you that perfect. And so he's taking all the time our griefs and our sorrows and giving us his joy. He takes our negatives and gives us his, his positives. And he's made known to me that there were three, three stages in the union with him. The first stage of union with him is the, is the union of interchange. Hallelujah. Uh, he furnishes the fatted calf, and we furnish the appetite. He furnishes the best robe, we, we furnish the rag. Uh, we furnish this, this grace, and he furnishes the honor and the wonder. Uh, we furnish the sickness, and he furnishes the health. We furnish the lack, he furnishes the supply, everywhere you take it. And that's the beginning of our new life in him. Uh, Orthodoxy, upon the whole, has only seen this phase of the union and seen this superficially. I remember the first time, uh, and only time, I had a visit with Gerald Hurd. I told him this, that Orthodoxy's weakness is, it had only seen one phase of the union, only stressed one phase, and that only seen it partially. He said that's the reason he left Orthodox. The next phase of union with him is the union of partnership, or the union of interaction. He loves us in the loving, and we become partners in the loving. He heals us in the healing and makes us so healthy that people begin to take help from us. He gives us his joy, hallelujah, and makes our joy full. Uh, Frank quoted that last night. And he said this when John Mott said the ecclesiastical bloodhounds are on his heels. And they're a rough lot to deal with. If you could have, if you could have joy in an environment like that, like he had, the joy that he has now is unspeakable and full of glory. You can't be in union with him and have the blues. A friend of mine in New York laughed when he ministered. Somebody evidently didn't like it, and they said, "You think Jesus ever laughed?" He says, "I don't know about that, but he certainly fixed me up so I can't." <laughs> We do love you, Lord. Uh, he took upon himself our grief that we may have his joy. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. But if we're ever to be like him, we become, have to become partners with him in loving. We'll have to become partners with him on all the activities of the divine law. And the second stage of union has all of the elements of the first in it and adds the new. He literally loves us into loving. He forgives us into forgiveness. 
He saved us to the point of making, as Frank said this morning, and the way saviors with it. Partners in salvation. Hallelujah. That's glorious, isn't it? Hallelujah. Why, it makes you so help the people catch help from it. It makes you so joyous to get joy from it. He makes you so alive to catch life from it. He can make you so sensible, hallelujah, people begin to get good sense by associating with it. <laughs> Marvelous. Uh, and these two steps of union, the union of interchange and the union of partnership or the union of interaction, lead up to a third stage of union, which is the union of integration or life. And in the end, the sons of God will be as healing as these sons. The saved, those saved by the Savior will ultimately have the same saving element the Savior has. That, that's the movement to which we go. To be like him. And to be like him in love. And to be like him in health and healing. To be like him in blessing. And to be like him in dominion. Man is meant to have dominion over the world and the flesh and the devil and nature and all. Jesus brought back that dominion at every point accept the dominion over man's will. God has fixed it up so you can choose against him if you want to. Hallelujah. It looks like he's going to win out anyhow. I hope he <laughs> We do love you, Lord. <laughs> but Jesus Christ brought back the dominion over nature. He could speak to the storm and there's a great calm. We may have to come up to sonship before we can get the right kind of weather we're looking for. It's man's fault that he's lost control over the weather. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. When he comes back to obedience and, and perfect integrated union with Jesus Christ, he'll have dominion again. So we'll have the kind of weather we want, we'll want the kind we should have. Uh, Alcott, whom Emerson regarded as the wisest man he ever knew, said that nature now reflects the moods of man. I think Glenn has seen that in voice. Usually in wartime, in great disturbance of spirit, there are great disturbances in the weather. Blessed be the Lord. And in this third stage, we become extensions and contagions of Jesus in the kingdom of heaven. Here you wouldn't have to make an effort to do things. You, like the sun, you just shine and the, and the light does it. Have thy way, Lord. Have thy way, Lord. And here, as John Gaynor Banks used the phrase, I think it up at Indiana camp, and it's a great thing for an Episcopalian to say, how <laughs> uh, Great for anybody to say, but especially great for an Episcopalian to admit. Huh? Uh, 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 he indicated there can be no really apostolic succession unless you have apostolic success. Uh, as some of you have heard me say, if I had what Peter had, whether I'd ever seen that chair occupied or not, I'd be a successor. But if I only had the chair and didn't have the reality, the thing just simply petered out. <laughs> now, the apostolic succession without apostolic reality is nothing but a sham and a pretense. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I understand Brother Stanley somewhere broke out in a big laugh and said that, that Rufus says, if the bishop has the Holy Spirit and you accept the Holy Spirit, the laying on of hands of the bishop would, be able, would en uh, enable God to communicate the Holy Spirit through the hands of the bishop. But if the bishop did not have the Holy Spirit and had the smallpox, you wouldn't get what the bishop pretended to have, but you'd get what he actually had. <laughs> we do love you, Lord. We do love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, no, we're to be like him, and we'll reign on his throne. He that overcometh will ascend into his throne. Just, uh, in the throne of Jesus Christ, just as Jesus Christ overcame and ascended into the throne of his Father. And the end of this salvation is to be like Jesus. Not to be Jesus, but to be like Jesus. That's it. It's called the great salvation. If you're saved at all, if you've started in the process of being saved, you're saved and you're being saved and to be saved all at the same time. 
You're in heaven, you're on the way to heaven. Uh, and you're to be in heaven. If you have this resurrecting power and glory, you're resurrected, you're being resurrected, and to be resurrected. Well, if you have it, you're getting it, and you're to have it in full. And so Jesus expressed it in a remarkable way uh, towards the last, because the nicotine shall abound, he said, the love of many will wax cold. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. It's this, this perfect salvation act. If you just keep on loving, it don't matter what happens. Hallelujah. You're going to arrive in his likeness. But if it looks like everything's going to the dog, hallelujah, 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 and you feel like the dog house yourself, <laughs> uh, you give it up. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Well, uh, Rufus Jones was good enough at the last meeting he attended with us at Washington to invite me to speak before the World Council of Quakers. Uh, when I first met him, he said he thought I overly stressed the significance of Jesus, but he, he changed. Hallelujah. And when he introduced me to the Quakers, he said, you're going to hear something the like of which you've never heard before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew those blessed Quakers uh, knew more about the inner life than any other group. And I knew they debated the little teachings of Jesus, hallelujah, to love their enemies beyond any of them. But I also recognized with uh, Rufus Jones that the Quaker movement, except where it's in the activities of love, has gone a little cold. Uh, Rufus said the Quaker meetings, upon the whole, were very dry and very dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I knew those Quakers needed something. Hallelujah. Beyond what they had. Hallelujah. And I proceeded to give it to them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I gave them uh, six steps beyond the obedience to the inner life, which they express so much, that we need to go through in order to be like Jesus and partners with him in making the universe like him. Thank God for the inner life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The best you can do is to be true to what you have. If you're true to what you have, you'll get more. And a man that didn't know even the Jewish revelation, we infer Socrates by beating the inner life was so much like Jesus that the second generation of Christians said he is a Christian too, but he's born out of due time. Uh, in studying comparative religion, you often get uh, you often get a wrong slant of it. Uh, you think because they have something, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. There, there are many lights in the world. Uh, uh, the same light that lights us up lights them up. Hallelujah. Only one light in the world. There's only one sun. Hallelujah. All your heat and all your light comes from it. And there's only one light of the world, and all men get their light from him. And to the degree that men are obedient to this light, they can live amazing, amazing life. Well, don't you need any more than the inner light? Well, we could just have gone on and had a wonderful time without going through the painful processes of creation and all, if that is all that's necessary. But God wants an external universe that will be as perfect as he himself is perfect. Hallelujah. The whole movement of, of history, as Whitehead said, is the, is the movement towards concretion. God's purpose is not to send us here and hallelujah, hallelujah, have, and spend most of our time to get ready to go back and flow back like rivers flow into the sea and possibly lose the identity. We go, like, like, go back like prodigals, hallelujah, to get everything that our Father has, hallelujah, to become like it. And this process of creation and taking chances on man making the right, uh, making the wrong choice has been tremendously costly. But if we went out and become like Jesus Christ, and we have a universe like him, the cost of it is nothing compared with the attention. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy even to be compared with the glory that they had. Uh, and as Jesus put it, uh, a mother, no matter how much she suffered in bringing forth a child, it all turns into joy. That's thought that something has come forth.
And the more we suffered in the past when we arrive in this glory and this triumph, the happier we'll be. Uh, he takes the worst sinners and makes the best saints of them. He takes the sickest people in the world and gives them the best testimony. And this repentance that he calls for simply means, as Oswald Chambers said, we become the reverse of what we have been. Hallelujah. And you haven't really repented until you've given up the sin and become the reality that the sin violates. Saul of Tarsus is a wonderful example of true repentance. He shifted from being the chief of sinners to becoming the chief of saints. God shifted it, hallelujah, from being the worst enemy of the church to becoming the best. And you haven't repented if that thing happened. Hallelujah. Thank God for repentance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, our Quakers need to move on with us like everybody else needs and, and need to get in intimate union with, with Jesus Christ himself. And as many as receive Jesus Christ are given power to become like him. Frank understands that wonderfully and voice it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you receive Jesus Christ, hallelujah, he's planted within you. You've got a Christian baby. Hallelujah. And when you get your Christian baby grown up, he's going to be like the one who begat him. And while the eternal spirit is the father in one sense, there's another sense in which we are begotten ourselves through faith in Jesus Christ. And in that sense, as Isaiah saw, his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And so, if we're going to be like Jesus Christ, we have to become Christian babies on the way. There's no possibility of getting them any more dogs except going the puppy route. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Want more dogs? Hallelujah. Have more puppies. Hallelujah. <laughs> if you want more chickens, you've got to have more babies. Hallelujah. You want five dogs? You've got to have five puppies. Uh, and when you get a fast puppet, the predestination is set. Hallelujah. Fast dog or nothing. Hallelujah. <laughs> we do. We do love you, Lord. Hallelujah. And when you get a Christian baby, the mold is set. Hallelujah. If you raise him at all, he's going to be a Christian. And he's going to be like, uh, like the one who was just. And what a good time he has growing up. God has chose the growing up process. Reported that he made... Hallelujah, made one man. Hallelujah, made one woman. Hallelujah. And he's been growing them ever since. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And now he wants to grow a family in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And to bring forth this family, you've got to have Christian babies. Hallelujah. And you've got to grow them up. Hallelujah, hallelujah. St. Paul had great difficulty with his babies. Hallelujah. He said they're holding on to the bottle when they ought to be eating meat. Uh, could a Baptist evangelist say that his disciples backslides off and didn't get back so often, they got the holes to slip and can't hold them on either side. <laughs> we do love you, Lord. We do love you, Lord. We do love you. We do love you, Lord. Hallelujah. So you've got to grow your baby. Well, I can't go into details, but he's an expert in handling babies. Much more of an expert than you are in handling your babies, my Lord. And your third step, and we invite our Quaker brethren to go along with us here, hallelujah, as well as everybody else. The third step is to receive the Holy Spirit, or the gift of the Spirit, that Jesus Christ uh, went the way of Calvary, hallelujah, and then went into glory and received himself with power to share. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so one of the, uh, one of the main reasons why Jesus left this present realm was was to be able, on the plane of glory, to give the gift that he was to receive when he returned to the glory world. Acts 2.33 says, Having himself received this gift, he said, forth what you see in here. And so our third step in becoming like Jesus Christ is to get in connection with him through the Holy Spirit in the realm of glory and triumph where he now is. And if you want to be victorious and have power and certainty, you need to be in union with him where he now is. 
It'll help you immensely to study him where he was. There's no example behind us like his. There's no example of help us. There are no words that'll help us like the words he spoke to. Hallelujah. Uh, but where is he now? He's on the throne of the universe. He's in glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it's our privilege to be in union with him in his glory. Uh, you see that? Jesus is not in that tomb any longer, except he's in the tomb of everyone who's in the tomb. He's not on that cross at Jerusalem any longer. He's on the throne of the universe. But he is with every man bearing the cross. You catch that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And a Christian that's only followed Jesus, the historic Jesus, hallelujah, is a long way below his privilege now. He ought to be in union with him where he now is. And on the plane of the incarnation, the best thing you could, he could do was to be among us. If you're going to be a disciple of his, you'd have to go with him where he went. If he went into Galilee, you'd have to go into Galilee. If he went up to Jerusalem, you'd have to go into Jerusalem. If you couldn't take your wife and children along, you'd just have to take a vacation from home. Hallelujah. Now to follow him, you might have to go back and look after your wife and mother-in-law. Hallelujah. <laughs> to follow him now is to obey him. To follow him then was to be with him where he was. But now, since he's become omnipresent, to follow him, hallelujah, is happy a beat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When I was over at Rome with Glenn, the most interesting place to me in Rome were those steps where it said that Constantine, after he converted, went to Jerusalem and bought it. I saw the pilgrims on it with their shoes off and tears and thanksgiving walking up there on their knees. I wanted to go with them, part of the way at least, and the rest of the party is moving on. I didn't want to leave, and I knelt on the first step, but I knew I wasn't where Jesus is there. If I'd faced Hitler like Jesus faced Pilate, hallelujah, and faced him out like Jesus did, I'd be walking where Jesus walked. <laughs> I walked around the room where I said Peter, Peter and Paul walked, but I was a sightseer. <laughs> uh, and they were facing reality. Hallelujah. You might spend all of your days in the Holy Land and remain unholy. <laughs> uh, and you may never see the so-called Holy Land and be holy. Hallelujah. Nobody knows that better than Frank. Hallelujah. 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 And it's my high privilege now. Hallelujah. Not only, hallelujah, to know the Jesus of history, uh, the Jesus of the past, but to know the Jesus of the present. And my highest relationship now with him is for him to be in me and for me to be in him. Two people in Macon some years ago had almost the same vision. It was the vision of a great pit of people. A majority of them are walking out and running over each other in the broad way of death. A few were walking up the straight and narrow way of life. And they were all going single file. Why? Because in this highest path of all, Jesus walked in his disciples and his disciples walked in him. It helps you wonderfully, uh, uh, as Frank has made with such simplicity, it helps you wonderfully to have a chair and you have him there. For he's not only within you, he's without you too. He's within and without and above. St. Patrick said he, he wants to be within you, and he's and behind you, in front of you, and on each side of you, above you and below you, and on the throne of the universe at the same time. So Oliver Lodge was the first one who called my attention to the fact that in the, in the glorification of Jesus, he becomes omnipresent. He's knocking to come in the whole universe now, and when he comes in, he can give all his attention to each one of us, not neglect him the rest of us. If I ever make it, I'd have to have his whole attention, I'm sure. <laughs> if I ever make it, I'll have to have him on the inside of me. Hallelujah, and I'll have to be in him. That's, that's what the Christian life now is, it's best. The glorified Lord, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh, hands of your hands, feet of your feet, eyes of your eyes, perfect everything of your everything. Changing your everything as fast as you submit to it, intellectness of this perfect everything. That's what it is. 
That's what the Christian life is now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's the deeper work of the gift of the Holy Spirit. An ineffable union with Jesus Christ. The first phase of this union that he made so precious to me was when I was, I never was a Christian scientist. I was a Christian science student. I wanted to see what they had. I wanted to see if they had a form of, of idealism more vital than Platonic idealism, a New England tri transcendentalism, and uh, other forms of idealism in the world. I knew the thought had so much to do with it. And the person who introduced me into this new world, hallelujah, became a practitioner afterwards and wrote to me to treat her. And it's perfectly legitimate to treat a person if you treat them right. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I tried affirmation, I tried the old way of praying. She'd gotten into deep sag of depression, and I couldn't lift her at all. I wrote long letters. I made a trip, and I think she got worse while I was talking to her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is Friday night. Saturday morning, went to see her again. I think she was worse when I saw her Saturday morning, but then she was Friday night. And I think when I prayed with it, she is worse after I prayed than it was before. Hallelujah. It is very serious to me. Hallelujah. 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 Your power to treat can't break anything like a case of depression. And so I said to the Lord on the way to getting the train, all of us might get into this condition that the friend is in. And what's the remedy for it? And the answer was justification by faith. And justification by faith means receptivity and response to him. I read uh, the Epistles of Faith, Romans and Galatians, on the way to Macon. This was Saturday. I think Monday I received a letter indicating she's getting worse. Uh, I, I did a very sensible thing. I got my paper before me and told the Lord what a failure I'd been. And unless he gave me something uh, better than I'd been writing, I just wouldn't write anything. And I refused to write. Recognized I was the end of myself. He gave me just one sentence. Your trouble is... You're identifying yourself with your past sins and blunders and mistakes, and now you're identifying yourself with your brain and nervous system. Reverse that. Identify yourself with God, with Jesus Christ, and now you yourself with the good you can do in the world. I was put in the kingdom of heaven, a fraction, and stayed in for about two weeks without getting out. Just everything was in terms of identification. Well, so I found out when our letters crossed that she had set free about that same time. Uh, the one who... Gave me the life in Macon to do the work up in Montego, Tennessee. And I went on in the letter to say that you may be in God's image and likeness as an absolute fact, but as a matter of experience, you, you, you are in your identification. Your leading love or your leading fear usually has it. And I said the highest identification of choice is with the Spirit and Lord. And it's not how long you've been identified with him, but how fully. I, I said, you might be out in the mist all day, be essentially dry at night, dry off as fast as you get wet. Sometimes faster. Hallelujah. Some poor fellow hasn't had any water in sunset and falls in the creek, and he's the wettest one of all. He's not looking how long you've been exposed to moisture, but how wet you are. He's not looking how long you've been playing with union, but how deeply you're in union. Illustrated by Saul of Tarsus. As long as identified with the enemies of Jesus, chief of sinners. Quickly after he's identified with Jesus, he's come to chief of saints. Have thy way, Lord, have thy way. And in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the word given was uh, ineffable union. And that's what Jesus Christ wants now, ineffable union. Uh, it, it's so glorious you can't describe it. He and us and we and him. And I rather feel it's a new baptism that must come. Frank has said, it's either a planetary Pentecost or planetary destruction. And the Lord is ready to give a baptism to the church now that will meet the needs of the church now as adequately as what he gave at Pentecost met the needs of the early church. And our needs are greater. I don't think we should hold him to any particular mold. 
I think the baptism, as I said before, will be at that point where you happily give every bit of yourself to him. And he knows it and he takes over. I had prejudice against speaking in tongues, and I told the Lord, if he could just spare me the tongues, give it to me, hallelujah, in my own language, of course, I'd appreciate it. But if he couldn't use the English language, why, of course, I'd have to take it the way he gave it. Hallelujah. And when the power and glory took possession of me, it, as I indicated, in beautiful English, and it was about eight months afterwards before he commenced using foreign words and phrases. And since then, I have the double gift. If I'm with a Pentecostal friend, if I couldn't speak in tongues, they feel I have good material for reconversion. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As I have a good time with them. Hallelujah. And can teach them that what they need, like everybody else needs, is this glorious human. That's this the deeper will. And when I get in the brethren, you don't like much noise. Hallelujah. Brother Stanley is one of the best friends I've ever had. And he believes in the Holy Spirit. But he wants it in as quiet a way as you can. Hallelujah. When I read his last book, I had the feeling that Stanley is so afraid of the thunder, he almost puts the brakes a little on the lightning. <laughs> we, do, we do love you, Lord. We do love you. Hallelujah. Uh, and of course, it's the, it's the lightning that does the killing and not the thunder. And if you survive to hear the thunder, why, well, you... you, uh, you You've not been killed. Hallelujah. That's one good thing. <laughs> but in blasting rocks, they haven't found any method yet where you can blast rocks in a quiet way. Hallelujah. 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 But it's a still small voice. And anyway, uh, the whole religious world could be brought together uh, in union on a baptism in terms of what Jesus promised on the last night. That is... He'd become a reality in this baptism. He'd come within in this baptism, and they'd be set up a fruit-bearing, glorious, ineffable union. And that's the kind of a baptism I look forward to the future. Well, what is there after the baptism? You're just getting ready now to go to places after you receive the baptism. You haven't gone. You're not graduated. Hallelujah. You're just, hallelujah, moving out of the kindergarten stage in about grade one. Blessed be the Lord. Hallelujah. And after you receive him, and after you receive the Holy Spirit, and you never get the Holy Spirit, you just receive. It's, he's the gift, not something you get. But to abide in him, and to overcome, and become like him, you've got to become partners with him in loving. You've got to become partners with him in meeting evil with good. You've got to become partners with him in healing the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This cannot be done entirely for you. And so our, our fourth step, hallelujah, uh, uh, is, is the great step, where you become an overcomer. And as Glenn has indicated so well, when you meet an evil, you either overcome it or it overcomes you. If you overcome it, you've got a good standing place for higher ground. If you marry a very difficult woman like John Wesley did, and you hold on and don't divorce her, a Methodist church may come out of you. Hallelujah. 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 But if you divorce Mrs. Wesley, hallelujah, you likely will not be heard from. There's so many people doing that. Hallelujah. You're just commonplace in that realm. But if you can stand the worst and do the best in the midst of it, you're going to be heard from. Hallelujah. 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 Thank God for John. And then John, John traveled on horseback and in a carriage 279,000 miles. If he'd have been as happily married, hallelujah, some of you are. He could never stay away from home that far. <laughs> So Mrs. Wesley added to the fathers of the gospel. Hallelujah. <laughs> as well as help to produce a message church. Hallelujah. You just take it if you're badly tied up. Hallelujah. That the Lord will not give anyone any problem too big for the Lord in that one. And you can just thank God that you are ready for something difficult. And you've saved all of the others. Hallelujah. From that particular problem. Hallelujah. Thank God for what you have. Hallelujah. 
Uh, if you ever expect to be heard from, hallelujah, anything to come out of your loins. If anybody does any divorcing, you let the sinner do it, hallelujah. It's all right for the devil to take people away from home, but the Lord don't leave people away from home, hallelujah. He'll make you equal to any husband or any wife that ever comes your way, hallelujah. You might better pray before you get her, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> but after you get her, stand by. Somebody wrote me about someone. Hallelujah. Is it his courage you admire? I wrote back and said, uh, uh, you don't have to take me up in your airplane. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, but if you put me out, I have to take you up as murder. <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't have to marry her. Hallelujah. But if you agree to see what comes out of the marriage through when you do do it. You expect to have a good time here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A good time. Hallelujah. Become an overcomer. Don't be overcome. Don't run away from your problems. Face your problems in the mind and spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Become somebody. And the overcomer does become somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The more you have to overcome. Hallelujah. The greater part of you are in Jesus and overcoming evil with good. Hallelujah. You go to places when you overcome. As one third Judge Black said, you cannot lick the devil with his own kind of fire. He has a great deal more of that kind of fire used than you have, and he's more skillful in handling. But you can defeat it on the plane of the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, is there anything after overcoming? Overcoming brings you to the place where you get in him and stay in him and don't go out anymore. Overcoming will put you in his throne just as he overcame and ascended to the throne of his father. The overcomer gets everything. Hallelujah. My, the high privilege of becoming an overcomer. Hallelujah. And he, he says more to me now about the heavenly marriage than anything else, except I'm to always go in love, and I'm going to give his love to everybody. He's made it easier for me than anybody else I know of. He don't tell me necessarily I have to love folks, but I do have to give them his love. And I find when I go around giving them his love, I have a little myself. No matter what anybody does to me, I can just whisper back, back, Jesus Christ loves you greatly. And in giving you his love, I, I get a little love. If I was around giving the devil hate, I couldn't help but get it. And the highest commandment of all is not the commandment of the law, but the highest commandment of all is the new commandment of Jesus, to love as he loves. Love our enemies like God loves his enemies. Love the brethren like he loves the brethren. And he gives you the ability to do the loving. I'd be in an awful fix if I had to love my neighbors myself, and I wouldn't love him over the much sin. Hallelujah. But if I'm to receive Jesus Christ's love and give him this love and pass it on, I have a happy task, and I'm not under condemnation. Blessed be the Lord. And uh, I have a little rejuvenation. Frank referred to me as being kindly old than the rest of them. I think I'm really younger than most of the rest of them. I haven't had a dose of medicine I'm not, for 39 years. I'm hardly ever tired. A doctor friend wanted to examine me some time ago and said my heart is about 30 years old. My heart is really young. I hardly ever get tired. I'm slow like Moses was. Hallelujah. Jesus got two and 40 days. And Moses hung around 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and Moses didn't amount to anything much until he was able. I hope to amount to something. I'll do between now and 120. <laughs> we do love you, Lord. We do love you, Lord. And so I asked the Lord once in prayer, uh, what was the secret of this rejuvenation? What is this fountain of professional youth that people have looked for? And it came right back to me, married to me. Well, I didn't know what it meant. If you don't know what anything means, don't be asking questions. People who don't know either, but ask the one who knows. So I said, what does it mean to be married to you? And came right back to be holy each other. Well, that's what a good marriage is, isn't it? You're not really married unless that thing happens. And the human order at its best is only a reflection of the divine order. So the heavenly marriage is to be holy his so he can be holy ours. Well, Jesus is about 33 years old, hallelujah. And if we get good married to him, hallelujah, we don't have to stay older and, uh, and old and ugly. We'll be rejuvenated. Uh, all the glimpses you get in the heavenly world seems to indicate that uh, 
the, all the old people there come back to about 30 years old, and all the children grow up to that age. In other words, it's to be the perfect age as well as perfect everything else. And I'd be very much embarrassed in the heavenly realm if I was old and ugly and Jesus was young and beautiful. Hallelujah. No man would marry an old sister, hallelujah, if he is young. <laughs> hallelujah. And unless he had the power to rejuvenate it. <laughs> and Jesus will rejuvenate it. Hallelujah. Uh, I get into the spirit, I'm going to be about one of the youngest of his disciples. I don't look it, but I feel it. <laughs> we do love you, Lord. We do love you. Uh, and he wants... You, you see this wonder of marriage. You can marry a... Without being worth a cent, you can marry a billionaire. And you're at once in a in new relationship. You become a billionaire, no not you might never have been able to draw a check. Hallelujah. Now you can draw as big a check as your husband. You might not have had any credit in town before this thing happened, but, but now you can just buy out the town Hallelujah. under the name of your husband. Hallelujah. And Jesus Christ wants this marriage so that everything he is and has, he can give to us. And in the end, he'll give us his youth and beauty and take away our old age and other Thank God I don't have to remain my kind. I object rather having my picture taken because I want to rejuvenate some more. <laughs> the trouble about these pictures is they look so much like you. <laughs> we do love you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Is there anything beyond the marriage? Yes, I think the marriage will culminate in a body like the glorified, resurrected body of Jesus Christ. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And I think those people in heaven are much happier than we are. But I think the thing they're looking forward to is to bring the glory of heaven right down here so we can have a new heaven and a new earth. Hallelujah. And I was writing that, that heaven is as sincerely anxious to come to earth as we claim to be to go to heaven. But most of us are doing about everything we can to keep from going just yet. When I was writing that the power and glory of the heavenly world descended upon me as a witness to it. Heaven wants to get right down here where heaven is so much needed. Hallelujah. 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 And when you get to heaven, hallelujah, you'll be so glad, hallelujah, to come with Jesus and bring heaven on earth. God would never create an external universe unless he meant for it in. God's not simply in the experimental stage. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There should be a new heaven and a new earth, a new everything. There's to be a perfect everything. Hallelujah. And Jesus Christ is the, is the beginning of this perfect everything. He's the new man. He's the new everything. And he's going to bring forth a body in his own likeness. And through this body in his own likeness, he's going to make a universe like himself. The creation itself is groaning and waiting what for? Waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. Nature was not meant to be in bondage, but nature has to wait until we come back. Uh, and so you and I have the privilege of being partners with Jesus and making this universe like it. And the salvation is not only to be personal, it's to be social, it's to be cosmic. Uh, I guess it's about time to go to your prayer meeting. Let's pray the prayer of invocation. You say, precious Lord Jesus, if I'm not willing to receive you, and all you have for me, I'm willing to be made with it. I want all you have for me. All I know of, and all I don't know of. I want it all. Go to your prime. Thank you, Tom.